go over the program a little bit. Um, so it's really good to see you. Uh, Nick Tomaskovic, is that correct? Close enough. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Nick from admissions, I think you've already communicated with several times. So Nick is here with me. Um, Nick, anything to say off the top or do you want to come in at the end? Well, just uh, first and foremost, welcome to everybody here and, and thank you so much for taking um, time out on this this beautiful sunny evening in uh, in northeastern PA and in all points northeast, south and west. Um, just to let everybody know, I will be um, really in a supportive role, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Hicks. I think that that would work probably best to, to hear what he has to say and then we'll field some questions as they come. Anybody wants to throw in some questions for the good of the order or direct message us, we're, we're more than um, happy to, to answer and address those. I will make mention that we'll be recording. Um, I actually remembered this time. So anybody who would like to uh, get some follow up and, um, and review this afterwards, um, please let me know. We'll, we'll make sure that's available to you. Okay, um, so hello. Uh, this, uh, we are in, I don't know, I can't remember where all of you are, but we are in Northeast Pennsylvania. Where, what Nick said, it, it's so rarely beautiful here that when it's beautiful, we all freak out and we're all outside. <laughs> Everybody's running around out in my neighborhood um, as if the sun just appeared for the first time. But anyway, uh, wherever you are, I hope you're having a good day. Um, so our program is, I'm, I'm just gonna cover the basics of the program and and then at the end, uh, take any questions about it that you might have, because if you have a question about it, chances are someone else does. Um, and it means I didn't cover it in, in my uh, amazing PowerPoint that I'm about to show you. Uh, so um, this, first and foremost, it's a low residency program, right? Which means, um, you know, a traditional MFA program is residential in that you live in the city and you attend workshops every week. A low residency program, as you probably know, is low residency, meaning there's only two residencies twice a year for a week, January and June. The rest of the time it's online. You're working one-on-one -on -one with, um, with an author, an uh, experienced teacher, uh, really caring, uh, wonderful faculty we have here. Um, and you're going at your own pace. So for me, uh, this is my second program I directed. I directed the Mile High MFA at Denver. Um, I founded that program. To me, the low residency program is, is better um, because it more accurately reflects the life of a writer. You are, um, you know, alone <laughs> trying to balance your work life or family life with your writing life, uh, you know, and you have to work up that discipline with the help of your friends. And then suddenly you're um, very form, very uh, social. Um, you're surrounded by other writers as if you were at the AWP conference or you know, at a book signing or something like that. Um, and, and for that time, you are very supported and it's a very collegial, uh, uh, positive environment, but it is, you have to sort of be a little extroverted. You have to say hello, which is hard for some of us. So uh, my first time at a big writing conference, I. I literally hid in my hotel room. I really, I really didn't leave the hotel room um, unless you know I had to do something. But it was a scary experience. So the life of a writer is such that that you are, you do have to work up your own discipline. Um, and you know, uh, for me, that means with writing friends and writing buddies to keep me accountable. But to you, it might be something else. Hi, Lois. And um, and then coming and meeting your peop your people. Um, for a week, twice a year, uh, about 40 dear friends who know exactly what you're going through because you're trying to be a writer. And so are we. So um, it's a really wonderful environment. The, the magic happens during the residency, but the work and dedication gets developed during the semester. So I'm going to um, just take you through a little bit of uh, the structure of the program. Um, you should all be able to see that. Is that correct? Okay. And then, um, uh, and then you can ask any questions you want, um, and including during it, you could just shout out. Um, so, uh, we were re recently ranked behind a school named Harvard. I'm pissed about that, but uh, I'll, <laughs> no, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so here's our program. Um, 
we we focused on we focus on uh, craft, community, and career. And by the way, if you are seeing a strip of faces on the right side of your screen, you could minimize it to get the full screen. Um, so craft, community, and career. Uh, I think every MFA program is going to give you craft, right? Most are going to give you community. May, I, I think not as well as ours, but you know, most you're gonna you're gonna make friends and you're gonna be supported by your faculty. I don't think they do it as well as ours because we stay with you after you graduate. But so be it. I don't think anybody does career the way we do as well as we do. Um, we really do follow up on the craft and the community to get your book ready to have it read by an agent or editor in addition to us. And then we give you workshops, we give you special sessions, we introduce you to people, we give you an internship so that you can have the kind of writing career you want, if that's what you want. If you want just to learn how to write and finish a book, we got you. If you want a writing career, we got you there. So craft, um, right from the beginning of the first residency, which uh, this year is June 18th, you will get craft lessons on the foundations of creative writing, um, craft lessons. You will have reading intensive semesters um, where you're reading, not just for pleasure, but reading as a writer, which really changes everything, believe me. So if you have 10 books to read in a semester, you will be reading them and it, that will be feeding your writing. You know what I mean? It's not just reading. Um, so uh, you have in the MFA, you have literary analysis paper, um, we have craft lessons during the semester. Every day there's a craft lesson around 1.30 uh, on basic things. The, the one coming up, there's a craft lesson on narrative summary and being specific during it. There's a craft lesson on, there was a craft lesson on writing biography. There's a craft lesson on dialogue. There's going to be a craft lesson on um, uh, point of view, which is a very tough one. Uh, so there's every residency will have different craft lessons. So by the time you go through the program with four or six residencies, depending on if you choose MA or MFA, uh, you will get uh, like 40 different craft lessons. Um, and we have you attend all of them. You, even if it's poetry, you're going to learn from it. Um, uh, if you're a fiction writer, if you're a, fic if you're a poet, you're going to learn from the narrative classes or we'll do one of each in case they're very highly specialized. And you're also gonna teach craft. You're gonna teach uh, creative writing. You're gonna learn how to teach creative writing if you if you stay until the MFA. The MA, I keep talking about MA, MFA. MA is three semesters. The MFA is the MA plus two semesters. Um, Nick, you got Lois? Okay, thanks. Um, then with community, um, we deliberately keep you in the same cohort in the beginning, your first residency, just so we can get to know each other and bond with your cohort. Um, those are friendships you're gonna, honestly, those are friendships that are gonna last your whole life, at least a few of them. Um, so say our graduates, uh, that we've been at it for 15 years and these guys have stayed in touch. They've stayed in touch with the current students too and with faculty for many years. So we, we set it up so that you're gonna bond with your cohort at least uh, a few and at least within your genre, but generally it's the whole cohort. They feel like, you know, they give each other team names and they really feel very special. Um, it's really cute. So, um, and that's sweet because the rest of the world thinks we're kind of weird um, for being, for studying writing, you know, it's not very pragmatic. Um, so it's really nice to be in the company of people who understand what we're going through and who believe as we do, that actually you can make a career of writing. And you, you, this is a not just a valuable endeavor, but maybe the most valuable endeavor, how to tell a story. It's how we, it's how we live, it's how we communicate, it's how we've always communicated, um, telling stories and writing poetry. So it is essential um, to do this. So we live in a very practical, pragmatic kind of country, um, but elsewhere, and indeed, if you think of world history, this is a very valuable enterprise, maybe the most valuable. Uh, I genuinely believe that, or else I wouldn't be doing it. Um, we do have faculty student social hours. We have, um, uh, you, you meet one-on-one -on -one with the person who's gonna be your mentor um, the next semester. Um, so you 
rig up a plan for what's ahead after the residency, because it's always the residency in January and then the semester, spring semester. Then it's the residency in June, and then you get a couple months off and then the semester in the fall. Um, so in that residency, you meet with your mentor that you will be studying with the next time. And you get to choose the mentor you wanna study with. Um, so you will be telling me, you will give me the, you'll give me the, you will be giving me the top three choices of the people you want to mentor with. And then uh, uh, this semester, everyone got their number one choice. So you're probably going to get your number one or number two. Um, and then um, one of our faculty mentors told me at a meeting when I, when I first took the job, I said, you know, how, tell me how, what your relationship like is with your students and, you know, how does it last after the, the program and one of them said oh we we stay with you like we don't leave you any and he showed me he has an email list of 43 former students that he keeps in steady contract in contact with so they are committed they're not getting paid much honestly i know this because i'm the one who signs their checks they're not getting paid much they generally love to and you know some of them are retired and they've had great careers but they just love teaching. They love nurturing. And I understand this completely because I love it too. They love help, helping someone to tell their story or to write their poetry uh, the way it, the work wants to be. Not the way they think it should be, but the way, and my, maybe not even the way you think it should be, but the way the work needs to be, right? So they love doing that. And it is really cool um, to do that. So I get it. And then career, um, and this is, I think, the most distinguishing feature of our program. Um, if you're in the MFA, if you go five semesters, the last semester is, uh, is an internship with universities, publishers, writing organizations. Um, you could teach at a university, teach creative writing. Um, you can edit a publisher. You can work at a literary agency. You can write book reviews. Something in the writing world you'll be required to do, and we help you set that up. Um, their agents and editors are in faculty, like not rookies, but agents with their own agencies, like experience. One of our editors on our faculty is the executive editor at Viking Press. Like that's as big as it gets. Um, and we have residency courses and panels on how to make money as a writer, how to be a good literary citizen, how to give back to your community, um, how to present your work in public, how to give good readings. How to, uh, what to, how to do a book tour, that kind of thing. Um, so that's all part of the uh, craft, community, and career uh, focus. Um, here are some more details about the distinguishing features. Here are the agents and editors on our, uh, on our faculty, and you will be meeting them all, but in particular, you'll be meeting one-on-one -on -one with one of them. Um, I left out one agent uh, we recently, one editor we recently hired who is an editor in poetry because we didn't have a, we lost our poetry editor. Um, but uh, so Ibrahim, the one in the bottom right corner is the one who's in Viking. Um, yeah, they're professionals, wonderful people, give great feedback. Um, the other thing that makes us in, uh, sort of unique um, more or less among low residency MFA programs, M MA programs, is that we give scholarships and graduate assistantships. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but the, uh, if, if, you have a resident, if you have a residential MFA program, then you have your higher, your full-time faculty are teaching in a classroom and you can give your students free rides because they're just taking another seat in that classroom. So you can give a full scholarship to a student because they're just taking up a seat. In low residency programs, not just ours, but all of them, we actually um, hire the faculty to teach you. So we're paying the faculty to teach you. So it's hard to give you a free ride because then we lose money every semester, right? By paying the faculty. Do you understand? That's probably too administrative for you to care about. But the point is, if you, if you run a low residency program, the reason why some of you might get a scholarship offer from a residential program, but not from a low residency program is because those low residency programs can't usually give uh, scholarships or uh, free rides. In our case, we happen to have um, six endowed scholarships for 
partial credit, almost half or a third credit of a semester. Our average semester is a little below 7,000 a semester. The scholarships are for anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000, somewhere around 2,500 or so, so about a third. And we have six uh, or seven, gra seven graduate assistantships. Uh, graduate assistantship, you get a third or two thirds of your tuition off in exchange for doing a little work for one of our publishers that we're associated with or, um, or work at uh, the, or work for my office, um, editing uh, our online publications, which are at the bottom of the screen. The Right Life is a, a blog uh, unique to our program, our, our own members um, post blogs. And then Revise This is our newsletter. So we, we actually give students graduate assistantships. Um, so a third or two thirds off their tuition if they would edit those publications for us. And there are various other um, assistantships as well, uh, even on Wilkes campus. Uh, and there's a theater, the Kirby, the Kirby Theater in, in Wilkesbury that uh, uh, has graduate assistantships from Wilkes. So there's a bunch. And what we do every semester is we take nominations for the scholarships. I just sent out an email today about the June, the fall scholarships. And we send out an email about what graduate assistantships are available. And then the students nominate themselves or are nominated for the scholarships or they apply for the assistantships. And um, because there's 12 or 13 total, and there's only 48 in the program, uh, chances are, you know, you have a good chance of getting at least one of these. Um, and the assistantships are for, the, you see on the screen, the different organizations um, that you could uh, assist for. The most prominent of which is probably Etruscan Press. Um, that is, well, was named one of the top four small presses at by AWP uh, in the country. And it, it's a wonderful press. They're doing uh, almost exclusively this year and next uh, publications by black writers uh, or non-white writers, I should say. Um, they're, and they're, they have, they're, there's one book that might probably has a good chance of being nominated for National Book Award. So they're very good and the editors are great guys. And um, so you can work for them. And then um, an unusual number of published or produced alumni, that is, uh, alumni who have published books, sometimes several books. Maroa on the bottom left, uh, that's her first book. She just published a second book, um, second novel that got very well reviewed in New York Times and Washington Post. Um, and uh, Leah on the bottom, uh, the book is called Unashamed. Um, I don't have my reading glasses on, but it's a confession of a fat black Muslim woman, I think. And she's also a uh, a plus model. She's, uh, she's uh, great. She's probably one of our celebrity alumni. Um, so uh, we have um, a remarkable number of uh, published alums, poetry, uh, nonfiction, fiction, and also uh, alumni, students who have uh, sold their films, who have written, written screenplays and sold their films. Uh, one of which, we had one student who was a playwright who uh, produced a play. The play was produced in New York uh, called N or the N word. No, it's called N. And then it got, um, it was made into a movie. It was purchased by a, a production company and made into a film called The Emperor of Broadway about Eugene O'Neill using uh, a prominent black actor in one of his plays and the difficulties that ensued. So um, really cool. And then on the bottom right, uh, our most famous alum, Marlon James, who won the Man Booker Prize, and it doesn't get much better than that. So we have really good, uh, really accomplished alumni. And I think, by the way, I think that's because our faculty stay with them. I, I really do. I think it's because they're talented and because they're great and they learn a lot and they keep at it, but also because they get supported. We have all these ed editors and agents and faculty who are very well connected and they help students to get published. And sometimes the agents that we have in our faculty represent them. So it does happen that students get published right off the bat, right after graduation, but it, you, it more typically happens a few years after. Um, we have an amazing faculty. Uh, I just was talking to Bev Donofri Beverly D'Onofrio today. Uh, she's on the top left writing Cars of Boys was made into a film with Drew Barrymore. Um, I, I, I won't name all of them, but you can, and you can look on the website uh, to read their bios, but they're remarkable. They're, 
wonderful writers. First of all, I'm reading all their books and um, they actually love teaching. They love their students. I asked them if I could use the word love and they said, yes. Um, these are our professional partners. I mentioned Etruscan, but also Akashic Press, you may have heard of. Um, they have they published wonderful books. Kelly Jones books, which is a division of Akashic. Uh, Northampton, Blue Moon Plays, run by one of our faculty members, Gene Klein. River and South on the bottom right is, a, um, is, a, is our literary journal, and you could work for that too. You could edit for them. And... Um, James Jones Literary Society uh, does the James Jones first novel contest that you may have heard of um, because Kaylee Jones, our faculty member, uh, is the daughter of James Jones. Um, and then also we don't, we're not snobs about genre. Um, you could write in whatever genre you wanna write. We will find a mentor for you and we will support you. Um, and that's mostly because we grew up reading all kinds of books. We didn't grow up as literary you know, fiction readers. We grew up reading Stephen King and uh, Jaws was like the first scary book I ever read. Uh, Carrie, um, what's the one? Exorcist. The Exorcist was my was my first scary book uh, when I was a kid. So we, we're not snobs here. Um, you can write genre fiction, you can write romance, you could write sci-fi, um, but you're probably going to get taught the foundational stuff first, you know, how to write a good character, how to write good dialogue, how to write good setting. Um, and then you kind of go off in wherever, whatever direction you want. And you don't have to decide right away. Um, and we just added on the top left, this year we just added spoken word, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and I still haven't heard from Prague. I'm supposed to have a Fulbright there. I, I had one last year, it got cut short because of the pandemic. I'm supposed to go back, but their funds are frozen in the Czech Republic because the COVID, COVID, it's a mess right now. But if I'm there next year, you will be there too if you want to be. We're going to have a residency there. It's a very nice city. It's my kind of my second home. Um, so here's the program structure. This is the kind of stuff I get most questions about. Um, so the you start off in the MA. Okay. So the first semester. The first residency, so for you guys, if you, several of you have already been accepted, if you come June 18th to the 26th, you'll have your first residency followed by your first semester in August. And that will be a foundational semester where you're taking um, any two genres you want, you pick. When you apply to the program or if you're about to apply, you name two genres you're interested in, first and second. You can do those two, or you can do a completely different one, knowing you might come back to it later. And I'll explain that. But the first semester, you take two courses, writing two different genres and reading in those genres, a kind of foundational uh, course in each genre. Come back in January, you have another residency. Um, you meet with your cohort because you haven't seen them in six, in, uh, six months. You meet with them, you workshop your stuff, you bond with them, take classes. Your second semester, one, one three credit course is an intense study of reading in one genre. And then the other one is writing in the same genre. So you pick, uh, at some point in like December, I'm gonna ask you, okay, which, which genre do you wanna choose for next semester? And that's gonna be the genre in which you write your book you complete a book project in two semesters. So from January to December next year, you're gonna be writing, revising, and finalizing a draft of a book or a screenplay or a chat book or um, even a film if you wanna make a film. Um, and then you're, uh, cause so you have the first, the semester two is reading and writing, semester three in the fall of next year would be your, um, finishing your thesis, finishing that book, revising that book. In one semester, it's hard to write a full length book, but you can get close. Like you can write drafts of the stories, chapters, novel, screenplay. You can write drafts and then finalize it in the next semester. And in between you meet with your, I mean, the whole time you're communicating with your mentor. You have uh, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever where you work out, you have meetings to 
check on your progress, give you feedback the whole way. You're guided, you're mentored in the true sense of the word. That means after three semesters, and then, and then by the way, you meet with an agent or editor at the end of that semester. So this would be for you guys, it would be January of 22, you, uh, 23, sorry. You would meet at that residency, your final residency for your master's, you would meet with an agent or editor and they would talk about your book. Then you're done with the master's. You, have, you get a master's. If you want to go on to the MFA, you tell me. And if you've gotten the right, uh, if you've gotten over a B plus and everything, um, if you haven't, you know, bombed anything, you get to go on to the MFA for two more semesters. And if you follow that orange arrow in the middle of the screen, then your fourth semester will be uh, a course in literary analysis in the genre in which you wrote your book. And you could start revising that book based on the agent or editor's advice, or you can write a new, like maybe you're still thinking about that screenplay class you took in the first semester, well, let's go ahead and write a screenplay. Um, so you can write a second, you can start a second project. You may not get it to its final version, but you can certainly get make a lot of headway. So you graduate with one complete ready to publish or ready to submit uh, project and then one draft of another one in, in a different genre or in the same genre, whatever you wanna do, it's up to you. And then that final semester, and, and that revision new project semester can be either part of the fourth or fifth, it's your choice. Most people do it the last one during the internship because the literary analysis paper is so intense. It's a 30 to 50 page paper, 25 to 50 page paper and a lot of reading. But that's the course that really prepares you for um, if you wanna be a professor, if you wanna teach a university. Um, and it's just a great course um, to know because uh, at the end of it, you at the end of that paper, you analyze your own MA book in, in conversation with all the great books that you've read and analyzed based on a particular topic. Um, so you're analyzing um, uh, how uh, these 10 books, uh, how they uh, worked in research if they're historical novels or you, uh, one student wrote about um, screenplays, film screenplays, the plot twists. Um, you could do uh, dialogue uh, or, you know, there's, there's so many, there's like 150, we have 100, I don't know how many hundreds of uh, theses in our office and online, oh, my, many different topics. And then finally, at the end, you're, to, you're in an internship based on what you want to do, um, what direction you want your career to go. If you want to be a professor, then you teach at a university. If you want to work in publishing, you do that. If you want to, I don't know, just start a reading series in your hometown. If you want to review books, if you want to uh, organize um, writing workshops for after school, like in high schools, anything you want. Um, then we set you up with someone who's doing that and you learn from them. After that, you get an MFA. So it goes MA and then MFA. And yes, that means you graduate with two different degrees. I don't know how they pulled that off, but that's how it works. Two very different experiences though. At the residencies, uh, those are the dates there. Um, you have workshops, craft lessons, panels and readings, very communal. At the semesters, one-on-one -on -one with your mentor or alone from home. Do you have some communication with other students through an online learning? Yes, you do, learning system, yes, you do but mainly it's you developing your writing practice. Um, at the residencies, you have meetings with your mentors, you have uh, communal lunches and dinners, happy hours pop up all over the place, I'm not involved. And then, you, but you're also at home and during the semester and you're, you're disciplined, you're sober, <laughs> you're, you're writing uh, from like 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. or whatever, whatever you end up doing. Uh, so two kind of different experiences, but they go together. Uh, at the end then, there is a final banquet um, and we have a ceremony for you uh, during which we celebrate you. Um, and uh, it's a great deal of fun at the end of every residency, last day of every residency, um, we do this and it's, it's beautiful. Um, lots of hugs, lots of appreciation. If you haven't applied, but I think I'm looking at many of you who have applied, if you haven't, this is a good time um, because we've decided, Nick and I have decided that if you do apply after this open house, 
uh, we're going to make a decision within 24 hours. That scares me, but we're doing it. We are doing it. Um, but uh, now, whether or not you're going to apply or you have already applied and thinking about depositing, um, now I'm going to just open things up and, and take questions. So, and by the way, um, the if if those of you who have applied and were accepted, the you you the reason why you're not receiving information from us yet is that when when you deposit this three hundred dollars, I think, um, that means and it goes toward your tuition. That means you're you're coming. We save you a spot and then we send you information um, or. We send you information if we have it. I just I just finalized that letter now because I couldn't get the university to decide if we could have an in-person uh, residency in June. They just decided we can if we make sure we uh, social distance, mask up, and get everybody has a COVID test, negative test, and uh, we got a tent so we can sit outside, spread out, have readings outside, that kind of thing. So now that I know that, I'm going to send everybody who's deposited that letter with a lot of information on how to get here, where to stay, that kind of thing. But until the deposit that, then we don't know for sure that you're coming. So that's my spiel. Thanks for sitting through that. I hope you agree that it's a marvelous PowerPoint, really. You agree, thank you, appreciate that. I worked very hard on it. Um, do you have any questions? Oh. Um, well, Dahlia, um, it happens to be a big, uh, sort of a boom time. We had a big class last time. We have another big class this time. Uh, the sooner, I'll say the sooner the better, but you need my information. I'm saying, I'm still working on that with you. So I will wait for you. Thank you. <laughs> if, if you're here, I'm waiting for you. Awesome. It's I want to be there. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the laggards. It's the slow pokes. It's the undecided people. We're just going to leave them in the dust. <laughs> I'm kidding, Nick. Don't get mad. So any questions from any of you? I do. Can I, do I just speak? Is that what Please. I do? Yeah. <laughs> do you guys help? I have so much um, writing I've done. Um, I mean, you know, piles of it. Is that, do you get help on, or, or is it an assignment comes and write fresh, or are you encouraged to pull stuff in? I mean, uh, can we keep bringing in stuff that, you know what I'm asking? Is it like yeah. in the moment uh, or can we pull our, I mean, I'm almost overwhelmed by by what I have. And yeah, it, that's it, the, the, the best thing, uh, about an, any any MFA program is that you have structure, like you have people telling you what to do, <laughs> and you have deadlines. So you you're working with me or your mentor, and your mentor will say, um, "Send me some something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. like you know, send me that right now." Um, and then you're like, "Okay, I got to get this ready." And then suddenly, when you're showing somebody something you've already worked on, you look at it again, like, "Oh wait, okay, let me read this over one more time." And it becomes yeah. kind of fresh, um, but yeah, you'll be able to do both. Um, okay. Okay. We learn most uh, if it's a, a draft of a new, uh, something new, mm -hmm. but and then apply that what we've learned to our old stuff. But that doesn't mean, and and this like when you're working with your mentor, you know, the first six first six weeks can't be old material, and then the next six is new. Like you can do anything you want. Okay. Whatever feels best. And whatever you need the most help on because sometimes you need to finish a piece you know get it out of your yeah. cobweb mind and then before you can move on to something new yes it's certainly okay. been my experience this week okay. um sorry um oh your mic's not working that's okay you can type in so let me see is that you nick Yeah, I was just providing a few. And Lois, Lois's microphone's not working, but if I want to apply no, early. Yep, I think Lois is having a problem. Oh, um, so Nick, do you want to answer this or I can? Lois's question? OK, 
Okay, so we hold it. The answer is we hold it. Um, oh, sure. So, um, so from the point that it, Dr. Hicks and, and the rest of the um, committee were to be able to make a decision, we would hold that um, decision on file for a year. Okay, so you could defer up to one full calendar year from the point of the admission okay. term. So hopefully that that clarifies and, and life changes, um, curveballs get tossed and things come up. So um, we're pretty, pretty flexible in that regard, Lois. And it Lois, would you like me to unmute you? Um, can you hear me? You did it. Yep, you got it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I've never used Zoom on this computer. I literally just downloaded it. So that's that's literally perfect. Um, that's okay. <laughs> well, uh, I was I was I was talking someone earlier and uh, I, I did express that I'm I'm doing my research way in advance just because I'm considering a lot of schools. Uh, I'm very anal about that door. <laughs> but um I'm I'm looking potentially one to two, maybe three years from now. A lot could change, of course. Uh, so, but I mean, I have done this in the past where I apply at least a year in advance. Uh, so I wanted to see how, for how long it was uh, to one to two years, the holding time or just one. So if it was one, I probably expected that to be like the standard. So, yeah. Nick, what, I don't know. I know we had, um, we had a, a, a first year student in college come to one of these and she was thinking three years ahead, right? Um, so I really admire future thinkers like yourself, Lois. So, but um, what's the best strategy there, Nick? Yeah, so, so while I fully appreciate um, the, the, the planning um, perspective, um, the application itself, Lois, is, is somewhat limited in scope. So um, typically we unlock two semesters, two starting points at a time. So for instance, the, um, the current applications that are available are for this June and for January, 2022. Um, typically the way that it works is within a number of, of um, days to weeks from the point of one application and one cohort uh, closing, the next will become available. So we generally keep two cycles open at any given time. So once the June uh, cohort fills and we're um, able to put a stamp on that, then shortly after the following June will open. But January 2022 is currently available at the moment and the application deadline is December. Okay, thank you very much. That works out. I mean, yeah. I, I don't, if, if it doesn't, you know, I don't, it's not a, a must thing. I, I definitely have an, enough time to prepare. So whenever it's it's best to apply, I, I definitely will. I will probably be in touch with you guys. So that's cool. the work. Okay, thanks. Alice. Any other questions? Yes, no. no. Uh, oh. Yes. Hi, yeah. hi. Um, I'm like Lois. I'm planning quite far ahead. I'm up in Canada, and they currently won't really let us out of the country. Um, well, they will, but they won't let us really back in. So um, that's an issue for me at the moment. Um, and I'm transitioning, transitioning kind of from another career as well. Um, but uh, my main question is more about uh, for international students, whether there's any limit, uh, limitations on the scholarship and assistantships mm. for international students. We know a little bit about that, don't we, Nick? But first, I want to say that you could, uh, you could take the residency online, um, it, especially these days, because we've learned how to use Zoom very well. Um, so you would be able to live stream residency from, from Canada if you couldn't come. But Nick, do you want to talk speak to that because I know you we had another applicant from Canada. Now this is especially relevant so I can give you try to paint as accurate uh, a picture of, of what we know at the moment granted that it's um, um, subject to change right full disclaimer um, but generally speaking you would be eligible for any type of institutional aid okay so that would include um, the scholarships that Dr. Hicks was referring to for your first year, for your first semester, uh, in addition to eligibility after that for the, the GA, the graduate assistant position. Okay, so that's considered institutional aid. So that is aid that is not tied to um, the FAFSA, right? The free application for federal student aid, which is that, that US document based on eligibility for citizens. Um, so that's, that's basically the long and short of it. So full eligibility in terms of, of what you can be reviewed for based on Dr. Hicks and, and the rest of the committee. Um, that said, um, 
most of our candidates would be looking into financing that or offsetting that possibly through some additional loans. Um, if federal government loans are not open to you, then perhaps a private loan. And I know we all, um, at least I do tend to, to cringe when I think about that, that four letter word that begins with L, um, not love, but loan. And uh, I, would, I would just say, look into some options earlier on and, and try to, to, to get a, a lead on what um, you know, good interest rates might be competitive to you in, in your area. Not being knowledgeable of, of the Canadian system, I, I can't speak to that as intelligently as I'd like, but I'd be happy to assist along the way. Uh, in terms of the residency, I know for a fact that you would have to apply for an uh, I-20 for each of the residencies in the MA, okay? Uh, at the moment, and again, hopefully this will change, fingers crossed, um, the government does not permit that to extend to the MFA, which is the second half of the program, those additional two semester 19 credits. Um, we are actively working on that, okay? That is on an ongoing conversation. So it's entirely possible that by the time that your timeline is, is syncing up with this program, um, that that might be an option for you, but it's just not at the moment. So, so at the moment, I would have to do the last two residencies um, virtually. Virtually. Uh, that, yes, and we could probably make that work um, with a little bit of tweaking. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Elaine, any uh, questions? Yeah, so um, if, you're, if you're interested in doing the MFA, um, so after, like towards the end of the MA, you have to apply again to the MF, apply to like a whole other program with like. No, S sorry, I should have been clear about that. You just, you send me a letter of interest. You uh -huh. just tell me you're interested in it. And then we check your, your grades and uh, we ask the faculty, you know, is Elaine ready for an MFA? Uh, uh, most of the time they say, oh, hell yeah. And then you're in the MFA. Oh, and it happens God. the next, the very next uh, like week or the next the, the succeeding system semester you start oh, yeah. uh -huh. okay great unless great. you need a break unless you need a semester off like you know just wrote a book <laughs> give me a break and then come back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. got it thank you and um and nick this is news um we got an alumni discount for everybody who goes to the mfa it's not 750 credit it's 675 so you get 10 percent off in the mfa everybody everybody gets a discount so that was like a little victory. We'll take it. Ridiculously proud of myself. For that. Um, so um, we, you have Nick's email there in chat. You have my email. You already have, you know, we've already been emailing most of us. So let's stay in touch. Uh, Joshua, any questions from you? Yeah, actually, I was wondering about, um, you had mentioned editing internships. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any sort of thing in the program uh, to like prepare you for that sort of business side? You know, not not the writing, but being an editor in, in the publishing industry. Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, yes, um, first of all, your faculty mentor will be an editor and uh, help you to edit. You can you can focus an entire semester on editing, but mostly it's that internship um, where you uh, and and by the way, you're editing your fellow students' work as well. But in that internship, you know, it's not like you just get thrown in, you have to be an editor. You, you learn how to be an editor. You learn how to edit. Um, whatever kind of genre or different genres too. So you get like hands-on experience with that. But um, I mean, all, almost all of us on the faculty are freelance or professional editors. Um, we're either editing for a, a publishing house or we're editing, um, freelance editing uh, people's documents. So you'll get as much editing uh, training as you want. And you could, uh, one of the graduate assistantships uh, is working for our university undergraduate writing center where you can help students with, uh, you can edit their papers or help them edit their own papers. And you learn a lot through that as well. But in terms of professionally editing, you're gonna be looking at, um, you know, manuscripts that publishers get uh, and are publishing like so you're not just looking at the slush pile you're editing a book that's going to be published um, in in a few months so you're given a book manuscript and you work with the author and you edit it um, so there's nothing more terrifying but more useful 
than that kind of hands-on experience because the editor of the publishing house will guide you and uh, help you with that. That's what the internship is all about. Does that help? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay. And obviously like that's all done virtually like yeah okay cool. yeah there is uh you know if you live near Wilkes-Barre you can come into the offices of Etruscan Press but they're all online now um we, just we assume online we assume it's all online as uh as someone who's never been to the east coast or anywhere near that of the states um what's can you tell us a little bit about Wilkes-Barre for those who yeah. don't know uh, it's, it's right behind Nick. That's our campus. That's our gateway camp, the campus. Um, it is a lovely campus. The city is old and beautiful. It was like gorgeous brownstones right along the Susquehanna River, which is one of the oldest rivers in the world. And it's, it's beautiful. There was a flood in 1972, the year my wife was born, and in, in, in she was born in Kingston right across the river. And um, it wiped out a lot of those buildings. And the city has recovered, but not fully. So the city itself is like an old industrial, like coal mining town that has partially come back, but not all. The, the area of campus, I think I'm being fair, Nick, the area of campus is just beautiful. I mean, I love our campus. It's just beautiful. And that's where you'll be. You'll be staying on campus and like, and you can always go, um, you know, you can walk along the river. There's a, a very nice river walk, dike above, above the river. And across, there's a huge park where students go in their free time, coffee shops, pizza, burrito, all kinds of places to eat in the city. Uh, just like, I want to say like five blocks away is Public Square, Nick. Um, so, and the students usually hang out together, faculty and students hang out together. We all go to a pub together and it's kind of, um, but it's, and it's uh, as a city, it is not the cultural, like it is not New York or Philly. It is an old uh, industrial city that used to have like these enormous, like pre-war mansions. They're beautiful. Well, now they're student dorms. Um, so there's big, beautiful buildings that most of which are, well, and I'm in one, my office is in one. Uh, it's a gorgeous building. So um, it's a pretty city. The river is beautiful. Um, it's just not like the kind of city you go walking a mile into the bad neighborhoods, you know, it's it's a little uh, it's a little what do we call it rough? It's a little rough uh, outside of campus, but we kind of never experience that in on campus. And what a lot of students do, we're two hours from New York. My my, my mom's in New York, so I'm making that drive a lot, uh, and my brother and sister. But we're two hours from New York, we're two hours from Philly, um, just a few to Boston, a few to DC, like. A lot of our students come to the residency and then they go elsewhere for fun. You know, they make a they make a trip out of it. Especially, we have a bunch of students from the West Coast, from the Northwest, and Southern California, Arizona. That's what they do. They see it as a as a gateway to uh, going to the shore, like going to the Maryland or uh, Delaware shore, or down to Virginia, which is like five hours. So it's, it's good to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, and it's a nice break after the residencies are very intense. They're wonderful, but they're also a lot of work. So it's nice to take a little vacation after that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I had a, a, a one question um, about, so for the internships, if you're, if you're interested in teaching at the college level, but then you're also interested in like starting, you know, high school workshops in your community. Is there like an the internship that combines both, or um, do you just kind of like choose one internship and and talk to other people about other the other options? Or um, you can kind of make up your own. We've had people kind of do a sort of combo thing, but generally you want to you want to focus on one thing you know, all the way through. Um, I th you can be creative though. Uh, you can pretty much do, <laughs> you just tell me what you wanna do and we'll figure it out. Uh, okay. There's, cause, cause I, like, I like not limiting students to, you know, you may not wanna teach for a living or you may not wanna work in publishing, but you're gonna be a writer. So let's, what are you gonna do with that? Like, well, are you gonna, do you, are you gonna run writing retreats for money? You're gonna edit for money? You're gonna, are you gonna write articles? Um, for magazines or like, what are you gonna do? Uh, if, if, if you're just gonna stay home and write books, 
okay, but we need to give you some understanding of what it would be like to do something in the writing world because eventually, I mean, a lot of students take the publishing and internships just because they want to know how it all works. It's mm -hmm. such a mystery. Mm -hmm. And some students take the teaching because even though they don't want to teach because they think, well, if I publish a book or two and I get invited to read, universities will often ask me to go teach a class, right? Mm -hmm. Or to give us give a workshop. I, when I had a book tour a few years ago, I would always combine a reading in a city like Baltimore with a class visit at the university or a workshop for the first you know, community workshop, just to make a little more money onto what I was already making um, so I could pay for the, for the book tour. Um, so you gotta know how to teach at least one creative writing lesson if you're gonna be a writer and you're gonna give readings and you're gonna be out there, right? Um, but we had one student um, decide that she wanted to do a reading series. So she started a reading series called At the Inkwell in New York. And then she came to Denver and started in Denver. And now she just moved to France and she's gonna start one there too. So it's like, she just wanted to have reading series for underrepresented writers. Like she wanted to get it out there for writers who are not typically giving readings. And she was enormously successful at it. Now it's, there are branches all over the country. So you just go with what you wanna do and and if it's multiple things, we can figure it out. Thank you so much. I was distracted in the first part of that because I saw uh, Dahlia's uh, text that it's only five hours to Cleveland. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's my favorite <laughs> it's not really ever. considered a destination either, but it rock is and roll city. Hall of fame. Rock and Roll Good Hall of people. Fame is here. It's, our, it's literally our claim to fame. Lake. It's not so bad. But Very it's, pretty. It's I love Cleveland. Mention it. <laughs> Except in the winter. David, if I may ask, um, sure. taking a look at the the program structure that you showed in the PowerPoint where you had the MA and then an arrow to the MFA, um, the MA describes the first semester as, as having a foundation of two genres. Are those two genres or would those two genres be different from any other that you might want to pursue if you do go to the MFA? Uh, yes, you could, you, you could change, you could... Um let's say, uh, take, a, uh, actually, this is pretty common. Um, so thanks for asking. Like, let's say I took, let's say I want to be a fiction writer. I take fiction and screenwriting. And then I write a novel in, uh, in my next two semesters and I finish a book, uh, finish a novel, right? Now I'm in my MFA and I might want to write a screenplay or I might want to write a book of poems, right? Something completely different, which I think is what you're asking. Or I right, might want to yeah. intern at a poetry public uh, publisher or intern at a film producer with a film producer. Well, I've had the foundational class back in the beginning, so I could do that. But if I want to do something completely different, then I just I you at, you tell me about it. I set you up with a mentor, and you you for one semester or for like almost five months, you write in that genre that you've never written about before, and it's great. You get like. You get coached by an expert. There's no expectations, right? Because you're just trying something new. So I've had students, I had one student write a graphic novel because he kind of always wanted to do it. And so I hired someone I know who's a graphic novelist and he wrote a graphic novel and he published it. And it was, it's beautiful. It's great. He wrote, he did it one semester because um, he just focused on that one thing. It's the first time he ever wrote a graphic novel um, because he, he didn't realize that you get set up with an art artist. Like you don't have to draw, <laughs> like you, you write, it's script writing is what it is. But it's tough to do, but he learned uh, in one semester. So that was really cool. And I'm not saying you have to publish it, but I think it's a great idea to try a different genre and um, one semester and at least write a draft of something, right, that you could be proud of. No, oh, that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. We're, Sorry. Lane, you get oh, the last question. Overtime? Sorry. Um, yeah, I had one last question. Um, there's so for like more like um, experimental, like poetry slash art com combining with art books, um, is that also kind of an option or is it more like focused on like the craft of writing and telling stories or um, just cause I, I have an art background. So yeah, um, that, yeah, yeah. So I was just interested I did to know if you guys had like sort of that sort of more, I don't know, 
I, yeah, I don't know. No. <laughs> like, um, when you, when it, I saw your application and I saw that you, when I, Taylor told me you went to the Rhode Island School of Design, I thought, ooh, she's going to want to do something cool, like uh, combining art with writing. And it's great. We will focus on writing. We'll focus on your storytelling or poetry. But by all means, you'll get some guidance on artwork as well. Uh, I think that'd be, that'd be glorious, be beautiful. I like cross genre stuff. I think it's really, I mean, everybody's, you know, hardly anybody's, you know, er, almost everybody's doing some bending of genres in their work, right? Mm, so. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Dahlia, you don't want to introduce us to anybody? This is Charlie. Charlie. Can you wave, bud? <laughs> hey, Charlie. The most one of three family. they've all i don't know if you've noticed but they've yeah. all popped in at one point just during this one hour yeah yeah they're well they're just always around <laughs> that's what having kids is about right they're just they right. live with you there they are yeah. it's true so i've heard <laughs> well, Thank but, yeah. Thank, um, thanks. yeah sure thanks charlie for letting us embarrass you <laughs> um cool. thanks everyone for coming uh, you have our emails if you want to stay in touch, okay? And call us. It's it's actually my job and Nick's job to talk to you. It's our job. That's the number one part of our job. So please feel free to call, okay? Or email. All right? Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Guys. Great Thank to you see so you. Much. Nice to All see right. you. Thank you. Nick, any last words? We good? I think we're good. Thanks, everybody. All right. for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Good night. Good night. Have a good evening.